<laughs> that's your answer to everything. <laughs> you hungry? Corn. Corn. <laughs> but I also, I'm parched. Corn. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'm Blake. And I'm Dave. And this is First Prize Films, the podcast where we each select a genre-specific movie, separate it by at least a decade, and pit them against each other to find out which film wins the coveted title of First Prize. What does that mean for us, Dave? Yeah, so it means the same as the serving size on a package of cookies. Hmm? Nothing. So today we are leaving the earth in ruins with these disaster movies. Bye. So I made Blake watch San Andreas. It's a movie about the San Andreas Fault throwing a temper tantrum like a pissed off toddler. (laughs) And I made Dave watch 1996's Twister, a PG-13 movie about sucking. (laughs) So they kind of stopped making disaster movies a while ago. They show up here and there, but it is kind of a classic genre film, right? They, They do still make those. They're just called documentaries now. <laughs> that's, that's true. I do have to ask, though, uh, mm. why did you choose San Andreas? Because The Rock, dude. That's fair. That's why my mom went and saw that movie, too. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Honestly, I'm going to be candid here. I chose San Andreas. Uh, actually, I wanted to choose this originally, but we decided instead to do 2012, and then we saw it was almost three hours long, and both you and I were like, no. So I picked <laughs> San Andreas. The apocalypse has to happen sooner <laughs> than two and a half hours. Got to keep that shit moving. Right. I don't have time for a long apocalypse. Get out of here. <laughs> so yeah, so I picked San Andreas because, uh, you know, it's the rock, and, and we're both Californians, and, you know, we live on the San Andreas Fault, so like... You're saying this is a look into our potential future. Yeah. You want to be prepared. Yes. I. It's, it's more of like, uh, you know studying really yeah no for sure um step one though is make friends with the rock as soon as humanly possible <laughs> yeah, pretty much for me i chose twister because this is a film i grew up with my family like everybody in my family is obsessed with it yeah and i haven't seen it in a little bit it's been a few years but i i come back to this movie often because it's so much fun and i have a good time with it and i wanted to dive in a little deeper yeah and see how it compares to other more recent disaster films yeah you know and uh, mm-hmm. there's so much fun to be had, I think, in both of these. I would agree. Uh, that I wasn't necessarily expecting. So I'm really excited to talk about these with you. Me too, actually. I remember being a fan of Twister as well. Mm-hmm. Something that was like exciting. It was never scary. That's funny you say that it wasn't scary, because for me, it was scary, because I was really scared of tornadoes. We both really? grew up in Ohio, where yeah. tornadoes abound. And <laughs> this was a very real kind of scary experience for me, but it was still fun. The characters and everything made it so much fun that I still love this movie. That's fair, you know, I guess the reason why it didn't scare me is because uh, I slept through a tornado once. You and my older brother mm-hmm. sleeping through s- tornado sirens and everything. Yeah, well, okay, the, t- the tornado didn't hit us, but it hit, like, relatively closely. Yeah. And I don't remember anything other than being picked up and, like, brought down in the basement. At the slightest hint of any sirens or alarms or anything, I'm up and pissing my <laughs> pants all the way down to the basement. It's well, just, I'm sure it- you can follow my trail. <laughs> know exactly where I went. I'm sure it'd be different for me now, because I, I wake up up at you know a fucking mouse fart at this point so not me i'm incontinent as fuck i cannot <laughs> <laughs> just pissing everywhere so that's Great. not even to do with disasters i just have bladder <laughs> issues it's true you've peed in my car you know <laughs> think of a place i've been i've peed there you peed there <laughs> well speaking of piss uh let's get into these movies let's fucking do it man movie one san andreas 2015 All right, Mr. Holland, give us the synopsis for San Andreas 2015. When the San Andreas Fault decides it's had enough of humanity's shit, it rips itself apart, taking California with it. We'll watch as the overly buff LAFD helicopter hero brushes off the mild inconvenience of natural disaster to save not only his family, but a couple of British dudes as well. We open to the San Fernando Valley to a teenage girl driving like she's never seen one of those overdramatic anti-texting ads. <laughs> she's reaching to the back seat and texting when all of a sudden, landslide. It knocks her car off the fucking cliff and the CG is so good. Dude, that's my first note. <laughs> the effects of this car falling off the cliff are hilarious. I'm no physicist, but the physics are totally wrong. Just... <laughs> <laughs> 
bing, 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 bing. <laughs> it's like pinballs down the cliff. As soon as I saw this CG, I was like, oh, we're in for a fucking ride. And then the rest of the CG was pretty decent in this movie, so... It was fine. This was a bad start, though. Yeah. So now we're with the Los Angeles Fire Department, or the LAFD, as they are being interviewed, and we are off to a terrible start with the dialogue. Two tours. And you're still flying together. I'm gonna break up the family. Dude, do we look like family? I have a feeling a guy named Chad who tells stories that he expects to be hilarious, but in reality, no one laughs, so he tells the punchline again, wrote this dialogue. Oh, God, I feel that. That's <laughs> so good. Yes, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Right. So for some reason, they're being interviewed while they're attempting to save this girl. <laughs> like, is the LAFD hurting for money so bad they agreed to a reality show? Like, cops, but less white trash and meth? <laughs> <laughs> they're also in Los Angeles. It's all about showmanship here, Dave. Fair point. So as they approach the crash site, they realize that the gap is too tight. So our hero pilot, Ray, played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson, pulls some ridiculous flippity doo moves to get into the gap in the cliff. But uh-oh, the chopper is going to have an engine failure in five minutes. Oh no. <laughs> it's probably from the flippity doo move. <laughs> <laughs> Things are getting crazy, Dave. <laughs> this is Chief Pilot Raymond Gaines piloting the chopper above you. You holding up all right? I don't know. So in the middle of this daring rescue, the car starts to slide in the only way possible, Jurassic Park style, and one of those rescue guys gets trapped by the car for some reason. So Ray decides the situation needs more muscles, and he hops in and saves the girl and his crew member just in the nick of time. Joby, I'm coming down. I love how this rescue feels like a tourist attraction at this point. <laughs> right. And the rock's just like rolling his eyes like, oh, he's goddamn noodle arm bitches. I gotta go down here. I gotta fly the helicopter, but I also have to rip the door off this fucking car and save the right. woman and my coworker myself. Just doing my job, ma'am. <laughs> what do we say we get you home now? I think that's a really good idea. So we cut to Caltech and Dr. Lawrence Hayes, played by Paul Giamatti, is giving a lesson about the largest earthquakes ever recorded which in California especially is like poking a bear with a flare while you sit on it. <laughs> so then a student asks, Professor, do you think something that intense could happen here? And the professor explains that, uh, yes, we're on the fucking San Andreas fault line, you moron. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but you get the gist. <laughs> How did you even get into college? <laughs> I don't know. Fucking God damn it. So fast forward to Lawrence in his office when his partner, Kim, comes rushing in to tell him that it looks like their earthquake prediction model is working. We got a rare low-level seismic swarm out in Falcon, Nevada. 23 small quakes, all tiny, 2.0 to 2.6. So they run off to the Hoover Dam to test it? Because why not? It's only the largest man-made dam in the world. What could go wrong? Sounds sick. Totally. But first, we're back with Ray as he gets ready for a road trip to San Francisco with his daughter Blake, not you, Aww. when he finds his divorce papers in the mail, which sends him reeling. I'd like to say no way would a divorce mess him up, but paper does beat rock. <laughs> <laughs> you, you fucking were waiting for that one, weren't you? <laughs> yes! <laughs> Anyway, he also finds a picture of him, his wife, and two daughters. Uh-oh. Is there a backstory here? Just kidding. I don't care. So... <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so we cut to the Hoover Dam with Lawrence and Kim as they find out that their prediction model does in fact work. And they celebrate. Well... Turns out they've blown their load before the lights even go out because suddenly a massive 7.1 earthquake rips apart the Hoover Dam, killing so many people, including Kim. But not before he tosses Lawrence a little girl. No, no. Close your eyes. Somebody was a quarterback in high school. <laughs> so we're back with Ray as he stops by his soon-to-be ex-wife Emma's new boyfriend Daniel's enormous place where he has to tell them that he has to go help with the earthquake. Because, you know, the Hoover Dam is in LA's backyard, right? As we showed earlier in this film, he could do the job of a whole team of men mm -hmm. by himself. The yeah. other people are just for show. Correct. Well, anyway, Daniel offers to fly Blake, still not you, uh -huh. up to San Francisco while also revealing that Emma is moving in with him and it gets as awkward as a boner in church. You guys moving in? Yeah, I, I was meaning to tell you that we haven't had a chance to. And before Emma can try and ease the awkwardness, Ray heads off to be an action hero. Now we're in Daniel's private jet with him and Blake. Yay! Dude, still not you. And he gives an awkward, cool guy, Elon Musk style stepdad speech to Blake. I want you to know that I respect what you and your dad have, but I'm never gonna try to change what you have with him. I would sure hope not. Have you seen Ray? He's fucking <laughs> massive. He'll rip the doors off of your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> He'll rip your doors off your body. Anyway, <laughs> we find out that Daniel is in the process of building the strongest, tallest building in San Francisco. See? Elon Muskish. 
<laughs> Once in San Francisco, Blake tags along with Daniel to an undoubtedly evil genius how to avoid paying taxes meeting where she meets a nervous British boy, also referred to as a British boy. <laughs> but before we get to fully see this meet cute, we're back with Lawrence at Caltech as he is getting interviewed. How come no one saw what happened in Nevada coming? Because we didn't know there were any fault lines out there. Man, good thing this isn't your literal job. Contrary to popular belief, scientists don't know everything. Oh, well... Good point. Shut up. Anyway, damn it. Suddenly, Lawrence's pupils burst in to show that their prediction model shows that the San Andreas fault is about to go off like a firework that fell over before launching. And one of his pupils asks, Who should we call? Everybody. All right, calm down, Daniel Day Lewis. The crisis on our hands, man. So we cut back to Blake and the British guy, Ben, who is interviewing for a job at Daniel's evil, probably, company when Ben's little brother, Ollie, shows up and embarrasses Ben like a mother showing up at prom by asking Blake for her number for Ben. What? She'll never ask for it, and then I'll have to listen to how much you regretted not getting it. Ollie's like that precocious young character who we're supposed to like and attach to, Yeah. but he's just kind of annoying. I mean, little brothers are annoying, I can say, because I was one. <laughs> you were one. <laughs> one t- <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Cut that shit out really quick. <laughs> so, Ben goes off to his interview, and Blake and Ollie strike up a conversation where we get his and Ben's backstory, which is about as important as the K in the word knuckles, so fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> it literally matters to zero degree. Right. Now we're in Los Angeles as Emma meets with Daniel's sister, Susan, who immediately outs herself as a Karen when she's rude to the server. And Susan has the balls to ask her. You have just the one daughter, right? Right. Your other one drowned in an accident? To put it bluntly. Oh, just one daughter? And your other one's fucking dead, right? <laughs> I just want to confirm your child's super fucking dead and not currently alive, right? Dude. Like, fuck. Fuck her. Fucking shit. So Susan is doing that grilling thing when Ray calls from his helicopter and Emma is like, oh, fuck this bitch and conversation and then answers the phone. But right in the middle of it, a massive earthquake rocks LA. Emma, listen, get as many people as you can and get to the roof. I'm in the helo and I'll get you from there, okay? Okay, okay. Ray swings the chopper to go and rescue her because fuck his job and all those other people. He's got to save his ex-wife. <laughs> can you legally redirect public health services just to save your own fucking family instead? Apparently. <laughs> he just does it. <laughs> it's the rock. He does what he wants. So He'll rip your doors off. <laughs> <laughs> So then we cut to Caltech to find out that it's a 9.5 earthquake that's heading all the way to San Francisco because earthquakes drift, I guess. <laughs> it's big. Speaking of San Francisco, we're back with Blake when Daniel comes out of his for sure evil billionaire meeting and he and Blake take off in his town car when the earthquake hits, trapping them in the parking garage under the building. Blake gets trapped in the car and Daniel says, We're going to get you out of here. And after trying literally nothing, he then goes, I'm going to go for help. And then takes off running back to the lobby. There's a girl trapped in a town car. Run! Back in the lobby, Ben overhears Daniel asking a guard for help when another tremor hits and a piece of building crushes the fucking guard like a toe under a bowling ball, causing Daniel to be like, nope, and he just fucks off, leaving Blake and also one of his shoes behind. (laughs) But don't you worry, Ben is also an action hero, albeit a less muscular one, but still. Very cute, though. Yeah. (laughs) Now we cut to Ray in the chopper as LA is falling apart faster than dieting willpower near Chipotle. (laughs) Oh, Jesus. Then the camera does this really cool zoom into the building thing to Emma as she makes her way to the roof as instructed by Ray while the building is shaking to pieces. She's finally on the collapsed roof just as Ray shows up with the perfect only in a movie timing. But uh uh-oh. The neighboring building tips the fuck over like a Jenga game during drinking night, causing Emma's building to start collapsing. Emma outruns the falling building and jumps onto the cable that Ray lowered to her. Come on! I got you! So they pull away just as all the buildings around them start falling over, but action hero Ray gets them safely out of danger. We're back with Blake screaming for help from the trapped car when she grabs her phone and calls Ray, crying for help until her service cuts out, because she probably has a Verizon. (laughs) Emma asks what they're going to do, and Ray tries out an Arnold one-liner. We're going to get our daughter. Of course, because helicopters run on sheer willpower. (laughs) This brings a whole new meaning to helicopter parents. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Wow. Anyway, another tremor causes more debris to fall on the car Blake is in, like the building has dandruff. But then... Ben and Ollie to the rescue. Ben, in the biggest of brain moves, uses the car's jack to lift the debris just enough to pull Blake free right as the debris collapses the roof of the car. That is an actual big brain move. I applaud all characters who actually use their fucking brains to try to get out of situations. Right. 
But uh-oh, more Tremors as they escape the building and are forced to play a real-life version of Frogger, but instead of frogs, it's Blake and the Brits, and instead of cars, it's people getting unalived by chunks of building. Just like Frogger. But of course they get the temporary safety when they decide to find an electronics store and try and get a hold of Ray and Emma. Sure, I guess. Lawrence, you need to see this. Here are the pulse rates before the quake, and here are the pulse rates now. Oh, this is not good. Back at Caltech, Lawrence is shown a bunch of scientific stuff by his pupils, which may as well have been in Cantonese because I understood none of it. <laughs> but basically, it's not over. Have no fear, though. Super Lawrence is here. He leads everyone to the media department and says to the kids in the room, Okay, who wants an A in independent study? I'm starting a new class. How to save lives by hacking media outlets. And thus is the story of how Anonymous began. <laughs> Please don't hurt me, Anonymous. It was just a joke. I already know that I suck. I got a media degree and... Hacking the mainframe 101 was not a course. <laughs> <laughs> so now we see the totally feasible and not at all unbelievable phone call with Blake and her parents, where she tells Emma that Daniel just left her. And after Ray instructs Blake to go to higher ground, Emma calls Daniel from the sat phone that they've been using, which makes a little more sense, and says, You left my daughter? If you're not already dead, I'm gonna fucking kill you. <laughs> Daniel's such a piece of shit. Do not fuck with a woman's children, especially when law and order falls apart because the world is ending. I mean, unless you want to die, but there's probably more efficient ways. She's coming for you. As long as she has a visual on her daughter, she's like, okay, cool, cool. I'm going to commit a murder today. <laughs> right. Now we're starting to get the backstory of the daughter that Ray and Emma lost, Mallory, and the engines in the chopper just blow up like they're the screen on an iPhone. And Ray roller coasters them to a light crash landing into a department store that's currently being looted because who cares that my home is destroyed? I need a new TV. This is the most chill helicopter crash ever. <laughs> She's like, what's going on? What are we gonna do? He's like, I'm gonna have to auto rotate down. She's like, what does that mean? He goes, we're crashing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> dope, dude. Maybe tell her to put on her fucking seatbelt or something instead of being cool. So Ray and Emma find a truck to take and Emma says, looks like it's been stolen. Well, let's do it again. And then Ray knocks out the guy who tries to stop them by pulling a gun on them because, listen, in spite of his bulk, he's quicker than a finger can pull a trigger. Faster than bullets, that man. Right. I swear to God, he's bald as shit. That's why he's so aerodynamic. Right, so now they take off with the truck. Back at Caltech, we get the stereotypical movie hacking scene, and as if that wasn't enough, one of the students turns around in all of his hacker glory and says, We're in. Yes. <laughs> I love this part. I was like, yay, media student to the rescue. Right. They get the reporter into the media feed, and Lawrence explains just how dire everything is, and don't worry, he did not overstate it. It will be so big that even though it's happening here in California, you will feel it on the East Coast. He looks dead into camera and goes, God be with you. Okay, maybe he overstated it a little bit. We have this scene in almost every disaster movie mm -hmm. where, like, this, this scientist man, he turns the camera, he's like, God be with us. <laughs> we moved on. We didn't move on. We stopped moving. So after we get a tense conversation with Ray and Emma about Mallory's death and how Ray doesn't want to talk about it, and me neither, they nearly drive straight into a crack in the earth that's almost the size of the wealth gap. <laughs> and Emma's like, What is this? San Andreas Fault. And cue the stoic look while he says the movie title. But also, what the fuck does it look like, Emma? What is going on? What is this? <laughs> so strange. So they stop and talk to a random couple on the side of the road who act like the earth hasn't just split in half a few feet away. And we find out that the only way around this massive crack requires a 70 mile backtrack. But don't you worry, Blake. You, Blake, not... Ray's oh, daughter, me. Blake. Oh, I'm in yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Now you. The man just happens to be wearing an aviation hat. And thank God. This guy and his wife are, like, so happy. You can tell it's, like, almost pudding time at the <laughs> home. <laughs> and then suddenly we're at a small airport because real life is absolutely that serendipitous. Ray and Emma steal a plane because fuck laws at this point, and they take off for San Francisco. But only after we finally get the rest of the Mallory backstory. Basically, he blames himself for her drowning while whitewater rafting and how it changed him and blah, 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 blah. Let's get back to the quakes, damn it. <laughs> yeah, we don't care about your stupid dead daughter, okay, buddy? <laughs> We're, we want to see some fucking shit explode, okay? So as Blake and the Brits find out that their only path to the building that they were headed to is blocked by a wall of fire because of course it is, they loot a fire truck for supplies 
eyes, and none of the mass of people walking like a herd behind them even turned to look at him. It's like the director was like, I swear to God, if any of you so much as glance at them, I will destroy you. <laughs> anyway, after some discussion where Ben wants to go one way and Blake wants to go another, Ollie is like, hey, dumbass, she's the only reason we're alive. And they decide up on the backup plan. Ollie's got a point. Looks like we're going to Nob Hill. So we're back with Ray and Emma, who see that the airport in San Francisco is destroyed. And Ray decides, that's okay. Now's a good time to check something off the bucket list. And they jump out of the fucking plane. This whole movie is like, hey, man, look how fucking cool Ray is. <laughs> so they parachute down into a stadium because Ray is just good at everything. And then they're on their way. But enough of having fun because the next quake hits. Everyone take cover! Right as it hits Blake and the Brits in San Francisco, they see one of Daniel's buildings that he talked about in the jet earlier when he was when he was having his Elon Musk moment. Mm -hmm. So they decide, yeah, let's go there because fuck all these finished buildings. They're too sturdy. If we know we can ride this thing out, it's going to be in one of these fucking buildings that is only bones. <laughs> At the same time, Ray and Emma save a bunch of NPCs before they decide to grand theft out of themselves a boat. Dude, Ray's in a fucking boat now? This is like transportation the movie. I mean, think about it. They stole a truck. They saw a plane. Why not a boat? It's true. So after Lawrence tells us that the most recent quake was the largest quake in recorded history, Ray and Emma pull their GTA boat into a small harbor to try and discern where Blake went, and a fucking tsunami hits. I'm exhausted, Dave. First of all, how is it just now hitting? Did the tsunami hit snooze too many times? It missed its cue. Was that for me? Shit, sorry. <laughs> My bad. <Ooh. laughs> At this point, Ray and Emma, fast and furious their way over the tsunamis taller than the Golden Gate Bridge crest, narrowly avoiding a giant shipping vessel that the tsunami flips onto the Golden Gate Bridge, <laughs> and one of the shipping containers lands straight on top of Daniel's billionaire ass before the ship rips the bridge in half like bad toilet paper. I'm glad we're catching up with Daniel who just goes pop on the bridge. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that guy. Then the tsunami makes landfall and we see Blake and the Brits making their way up into Daniel's unfinished building when the water smashes into their building at their height, like halfway up, which pushes it onto the next building like a drunk guy on the subway leaning on a stranger. <laughs> but the water is still rising, so they decide to push higher because these quakes shifted the entire ocean, apparently. Displaced so much fucking water. In China, they just have beaches for hundreds of miles now. After we see Ray and Emma driving their boat through the fucking city like it's white trash Venice, without any roadblocks, by the way, Water blocks? Anyway, the tsunami fucked up everything but the exact path that they need. Friendly neighborhood tsunami. Yeah. So Blake and the Brits walk down the stairs to a higher floor as if it's an M.C. Escher painting. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice that, but now that you're saying that, yeah. And as Blake, the apparent medic, is tending to Ben's wound for some reason, he looks at her and says, You're absolutely unbelievable. And then they kiss because the apocalypse makes people horny, apparently. Listen, there's nothing like a cataclysmic earthquake to get the boner juices flowing. Get my boner juices flowing. Gross. <laughs> Everyone keep your pants on, though, because this is no time to fuck. Blake's parents are here. Hey, Wendy. <laughs> no, <laughs> God damn it. Not you. <laughs> Son of a bitch. But uh-oh, the building just buckles like it's as sturdy as my back when I reach to open a cupboard. And it <laughs> drops like three floors but stays standing for some reason. Water rushes in and Blake and the Brits are in trouble, yet again, because their choice for safety is about as smart as skydiving with a Kroger bag as your parachute. <laughs> and to make matters worse, Ben and Ollie get separated from Blake and have to start making their way up, which is probably something they should have done before the building started to get lazy. Anyway. It's a good question. Why didn't they just literally go as high as you can up in this building? I don't, why did they go stop? To the top. Just keep going. Yeah. Anyway. God. As this is happening, Ray dives into the water like a buff dolphin. I see where you're in. I'm going after her. See, I'm glad we have Ray here. He's free diver extraordinaire. He's a helicopter pilot. He's a plane pilot, skydiver, door ripper offer, boat <laughs> captain, truck driver, and a hell of a dad to boot. Minus the one dead kid part. <laughs> So Ray finds Blake quickly, but they're separated by some debris in a doorway that's stacked up like a kid who's mad at their parents did it, and also some glass walls. After trying to move the debris for like two fucking seconds, Ray the buff dolphin tries unsuccessfully to break the glass, so he just watches Blake die. I love you, Dad. Please don't love but I love her so much. And only now does he think to try a little harder to move the fucking debris. It only took the death of another daughter. <laughs> 
strike two. <laughs> so he gets her lifeless body to the next floor as the building continues to slowly drop straight down because physics doesn't exist here. Nope. Then Emma drives the boat straight through the glass like the boat's made of fucking steel and everyone piles in while the whole time Ray is giving Blake CPR. Blake. Ray. The building is finally like, all right, I'm gonna head out and starts falling the rest of the way and the boat just squeaks out to safety. As the boat comes to a stop, they all watch as Ray unsuccessfully administers CPR before giving up. <laughs> I'm not crying. You're crying. I'm I'm literally not crying. Okay, then I'm then I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> but you wait a goddamn minute because action hero and buff dolphin Ray isn't gonna give up that easily. It's a dolphin with a mission. He tries CPR for like ten more seconds because apparently he hadn't hit his compression quota yet, and <laughs> for a second there, I was worried he was just gonna keep doing chest compressions mm -hmm. on his corpse of his daughter <laughs> and like the whole family like stop it's been hours he's like no i'm never giving up i'm bray that's, uh, that's it's, the arnold version of that movie I, I went way darker with that than this movie <laughs> would have but still now everything is finally settled because the earth's crust decided it's killed enough humans and the national guard the un and other volunteers help the survivors so emma ray blake ben and ollie stand overlooking the devastation like it's a painting at an art museum and ray thanks the boys for being there for blake and ben says but it was more like she was there for us yeah because she's the rock's daughter duh yeah the rock is overlooking the destroyed ass city like all in a day's work for <laughs> the ray <laughs> anyway in typical action movie fashion with a warm hue on their faces emma asks what now and the rock and the ray says now we rebuild yeah, no shit, Ray, but, like, what about the micro? Do you go to a hotel, an Airbnb? Do you just stand there until the credits roll? Oh, that's the one. <laughs> I wasn't asking for the most fucking ambiguous thing. I'm like, what do we literally do now? I'm starving. I'm wet as fuck. My friends are dead. Like, come on. And I got this British guy who's been following me around like a beat puppy dog all the goddamn day. <laughs> Jesus. Anyway, roll credits. Dude, this movie hurt my head a little there's some fun stuff to this movie there's like some fun goofy you. shit yeah. to it I, I had a relatively decent time i wouldn't call this like a top tier good movie but for its genre you know it does hit those beats and we get a lot of destruction porn you know what i i gotta say i did actually really like this movie i, I don't think it'd ever be anybody's favorite movie no. but like i thoroughly enjoyed it this feels like a movie that i would have gone to see when i was like 16 or 17 during the summer months you know i feel that i would have like brought some friends to this right, movie and like right. oh whatever like nothing's playing necessarily maybe you're like hey whatever yeah, let's it. see the rock mm -hmm. you know take every form of transportation possible <laughs> within a two-hour span it sounds great he didn't do a train well again we still have time for a sequel <laughs> well you know what uh while as everyone in this movie is running from the disaster in twister mm -hmm. everyone is running towards it like they would rather die in a horrible grotesque fashion the people in twister are gluttons for punishment <laughs> i swear to god i'm excited to talk about this movie oh fuck yeah you ready let's do it man movie two twister 1996 let's see what you whipped up for the synopsis for twister in a world where the weather has run amok one woman and her friends who look like they smell team up with her ex-husband and his subpar sense of danger to hunt down the monster who killed her family. Fast wind. <laughs> so we open to a sick action title sequence made by everyone's favorite <laughs> nephew who just learned After Effects. It's good shit, man. Yeah, sure. We also learn that this is a film directed by Yann de Bont, director oh, yeah. of Speed. Yes. Yeah, that guy. There's no flying buses in this movie, but keep an <laughs> eye out for livestock. So we cut to a small farm in 1969. A tornado full of lions is brewing outside of a farmhouse. <laughs> I was going to say, is this the beginning of The Wizard of Oz? <laughs> this is a big end, Dave. This is an F5. Fun fact, the F stands for fuck that. <laughs> The family inside the farmhouse, they rush out to their storm cellar as the tornado approaches. It's a father, mother, and young daughter, Joe. Mm -hmm. The tornado, remember, it's fucking huge. Oh, of course. It hits the storm cellar, and the father tries to hold the door closed as it rattles on its hinges. 
instead of letting go of the door, he holds on and gets <laughs> sucked right the fuck out of the storm cellar. Right, like he's sitting there saying, I can't hold it. Well, then let go, dumbass. His family's still safe inside. They didn't get sucked out. Why would you do this? I don't fucking know. Sir, I have notes. <laughs> So we cut to present day 1996 in this case, where the National Severe Storm Laboratory predicts a massive rash of storms mm -hmm. and tornadoes hitting middle America. You know, if these cells keep building like this, there could be a record outbreak of tornadoes. This is going to be a long day. Spoiler alert, there are, and it is. <laughs> Way to fucking jinx it, jackass. But boom, we're hit with the most whimsical adventure music I've heard in a while. <laughs> Hold on. Wait a minute. You, this does not match the <laughs> fucking theme about a movie about tornadoes. It's like... <laughs> It's fucking incredible. And here we finally meet Bill Harding, played by Bill Paxton, and his fiancée, Melissa. That's convenient. I know Joe, she's already dragged her entire department into the field. Now we keep meeting more characters. We mm -hmm. meet Bill's ex-wife, Joe Harding. Yeah. She's the grown-up little girl from the beginning, played by Helen Hunt. Yes. She leads a team of ragtag storm chasers who, I'm sure they're smart, but chasing down tornadoes doesn't feel smart yeah it also feels like they're sponsored by red bull and i know these guys are after that big high you know that tornadoes give them yeah but like have you ever tried drugs <laughs> <laughs> or like maybe bungee jumping or something like or drugs i'm just saying i'm not <laughs> i'm the anti-dare <laughs> don't fold the maps I didn't fold the map. There's a big crease right through Wichita. Roll the maps. Anyway, this ragtag team consists of a ton of amazing character actors mm -hmm. that you've all seen before, right? Yes. We got Philip Seymour Hoffman as Dusty and Alan Ruck playing Rabbit, who might actually still be playing the same character from Speed. He got into Tornadoes because of the adrenaline he got from the from the, uh, <laughs> oh, the situation. Oh, true. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. He's like in one jumping bus and he's like, <laughs> fuck, man, I gotta chase Tornadoes. <laughs> So Bill rolls up and the entire team greets him as if he's one of their own since he used to be. Right. But Bill isn't here to storm chase. He's here to get those goddamn divorce papers signed. <laughs> Bill is trying to get his legal fuck on right now before he starts his new job. It's really rather than a weatherman. What? I think it's great. Oh, you had that tone. There was no tone. If you have a problem being a weatherman. I don't have a problem being a weatherman. Of course, Bill is not a total corporate sellout. He still loves those sweet, sweet, sucky storms. <laughs> <laughs> and especially the prototype he designed to measure tornadoes. Mm -hmm. It's called Dorothy. Yeah. It looks like an overproduced science fair project a little <laughs> totally bit, but does. essentially it's a tub full of sensors that once sucked up into a tornado can do all sorts of measurements that hadn't been possible before. We could learn more in 30 seconds than I have in the past 30 years. It's something I didn't know I needed to care about, but I totally do now. Also, they're, they're talking about it in uh, what seems to be a foreign language, maybe tornadies. So Joe especially cares about this she's trying to hunt down that tornado that her sucked her daddy into the fucking sky <laughs> and blew his ass clean across texas or so legend has it we're not sure yet if we can get this new information we can increase warning time to 15 minutes but forget all this talky ass nerdy shit dave we got a live one tornado coming down hard joe we got major action the nssl says the cap is breaking towers going up 30 miles off the dry line bill may have shown up for the divorce papers but he'll be damned if he's gonna miss a romp with the old crew <laughs> so he drags his incredibly underprepared fiance <laughs> with him he just let her be underprepared it was a straight setup dog like yeah. this could not have worked out more perfectly for joe and bill <laughs> So now the team's on the road, and we meet our non-tornado villain, Jonas, played by Carrie Elwes. He rolls up with a caravan of black sedans, and this is a 90s movie, so you know people in matching black SUVs equals bad. Jonas Miller, he's a night crawler. Jonas went out and got himself some corporate sponsors. He's in it for the money, not the science. Can I just note here sure. that apparently Oklahoma is so fucking boring <laughs> that not only do we have a full-time storm chasing crew, we got fucking two of them. <laughs> I like it's so specific. I feel like it's it's like uh being really into something like bocce ball or something. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, both teams stop off at a little roadside diner, but here we find out Jonas stole Bill and Joe's design for Dorothy. He has his own version, and he's smug as fuck about it. She was our idea, and you know it. Unrealized idea. Unrealized. Now that Bill's confronted with all of this stuff, almost like it was written that way, his <laughs> ego has no choice but to force him to stick around and see if Dorothy can fly. He tells right. Joe, I'll give you one day. Whether she flies or not, I'm gone. All right, man, clock's ticking now. So we also learn here why Bill is so pivotal to this whole team. Mm -hmm. They call him the human barometer. Yeah, he's got a, uh, a spidey sense for tornadoes, a tornado sense, if you will. They, exactly. They say it's almost like Bill knows what the storm is thinking. And if I'm being totally honest, I want to see that movie right. where Bill Paxton <laughs> has a psychic connection to storms yeah. and he tames them with his powers. <laughs> Bill Paxton, the storm whisperer, storm commiss, <laughs> storm guy, Bill Paxton, storm guy, whatever. Okay, let's move out, people. Let's go. Where are we going? We're back on the road now, and it's just Bill and Joe in the truck together, and they're fighting like old times. Yeah. It gets heated until they, you know, remember the fucking tornado they're chasing. <laughs> so they move to intercept the tornado and put Dorothy in its path. But the tornado absolutely destroys a barn. They get stuck driving in this drainage ditch mm -hmm. because Bill's too fucking cocky for his own good. Yeah. And they crash it into this little wooden bridge as the tornado comes back barreling towards them right right they can't get dorothy unhooked because the funnel of death is approaching you know <laughs> so they hide under the bridge and the tornado sucks joe's truck into the air luckily it drops right in front of melissa who's driving bill's truck where's my truck yeah and melissa's being a little dramatic here but you know that's fine did you just miss that truck so I can't tell if I'd be like Melissa in this situation, you know, like freaking the fuck out, or if I'd be like Dusty thinking this is sick as hell. I'm fairly certain you would have long pissed your pants three times by now. I probably would have, well, definitely pissed. The piss is for <laughs> sure. How would you react to this? The first time someone says, oh my God, look at that tornado. Let's go after it. I'd be like, listen, we are no longer friends. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's no time to fuck around. There's another storm. So I guess they leave Joe's public safety hazard truck in the road right. <laughs> and just take off in Bill's new truck. Right, because the next tornado is going to take care of it. No problem. There's your pal. So they cross paths with Jonas again and his team, who use their fancy gear to go one way, but our ragtag team trusts the human billometer over here. <laughs> looks like it's turning. It looks like it's turning. The atmosphere is very unstable. I repeat, unstable. Can confirm. <laughs> they keep driving to intercept a fucking water tornado, and it splits into two water tornadoes, and that's not even the worst of it. I can't express the sheer level of nope that I'm feeling right now. Cue the flying cattle. The flying cattle! I gotta go, Julia. We got cows. To tie up this whole Wizard of Oz motif, you mm -hmm. know, I'm just saying flying cows are much scarier, if not more cumbersome, than flying monkeys. <laughs> So now, for the second time in like a, an hour, Bill drives them right into the middle of a fucking tornado, <laughs> and they get whipped around and shaken up pretty bad before the tornado finally passes. And Melissa, she is straight up not having a good time. It's okay. No, I'm not okay. This is not okay. Oh, Christ, I'm sorry. And fuck, man, I can't blame her. Bill might be the human barometer, but he also has a bad habit of driving them directly into life-threatening storms. Right. Without a plan. Right. She is me right here. Joe, some of us hey. couldn't help but notice how close we are to Wakita. Yeah, and Aunt Mac wouldn't mind a pit stop, right? So the crew worked up a pretty big appetite, I guess, avoiding a windy death. After they just ate at the diner, by the way. <laughs> Expended a lot of energy <laughs> not dying. Right. So they decide to go visit Joe's Aunt Meg in the town of Wakita. <laughs> She's kind of like the perfect aunt, you know? She's always down for a visit. She loves your goofy-ass friends. And she's always stocked with 50 pounds of fresh beef at all times. <laughs> right. I, could, I couldn't help but thinking, why does she have just random steaks ready to go? Does she have a pet puma? You never know, Dave. It's it's the Midwest. Right. It should be crazy. God, Mac, you got a lot of beef. Where'd you get all this beef? Did you see my cows out front? No. Oh. oh! After their meal, the crew regales Melissa with stories of Bill and how extreme he is. Most notably, though, the time he was naked, drunk driving, and storm chasing at the same time. I mean... And before they can tell her about Bill's other felonies, 
another storm comes. This is a storm that has uh, developed within the last 15 minutes. This is a very intense storm. So for quick context, they are measuring tornadoes on the Fujita scale, yes. which rates tornadoes on a scale of one to five, F5 being the biggest. But also none of our crew has ever seen an F5 tornado before, except one person, Joe. The big bad one that sucked her dumbass dad into the heavens. <laughs> right. Anyway, there's your foreshadowing. Yeah. So the team is chasing down this new tornado in town when Bill sees something. He has a feeling. We're going to have to get off of this road. This is no time to guess, I'm Ramsey. not guessing. Just make a right turn. Trust me. He senses the storm is changing paths. But honestly, I don't fucking trust him anymore. I think he's trying to kill everyone and finish the job he started with the first two tornadoes. <laughs> I'm waiting for the sequel where Bill actually kills everybody. <laughs> Twister 2, Bill's Revenge. I don't know. The inefficient serial killer. It's like the face of this fatty door a half a mile wide. Should be coming right over that hill in a matter of minutes. This is the one, man. I feel it. Needless to say, this is going to be a big-ass tornado, mm -hmm. and it's coming right for Bill and Joe. This is their chance to finally get Dorothy flying. They get closer to this CG monster, but live-action debris is falling everywhere. Right. We got hail, we got tree limbs, we got a boat, we got a tricycle. <laughs> I foresee a few upset toddlers in the coming days. Upset, dead, either way. It's back, Bill! It's not through yet! Now our heroes pull up and start getting Dorothy ready when fate strikes again. A telephone pole comes crashing down on Bill's truck. It knocks Dorothy off the bed, spilling the sensors out into the road. Bill, help me! Forget help the me! sensors! If it's anywhere near us, it's not going to drop anywhere near us! It's going to drop right on us! The tornado starts backbuilding, ready to strike again. Right. Bill, he makes the executive decision to get them the hell out of there, and they hop back into his truck where the telephone pole that hit it, it's mysteriously disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> so in a surprise move that actually surprised literally no one, Joe hops out in a desperate attempt to make Dorothy work. She's grabbing all the sensors and uh, trying to get them back in the thing. She wants this to work so bad, she's willing to put her life in jeopardy for it. Joe, things go wrong. You can't explain it. You can't predict it. Killing yourself won't bring your dad back. I'm sorry he died, but it was a long time ago. Meanwhile... Back with the rest of the crew, Melissa and the rest of the Stormbusters overhear this on the radio, and it's clear from her face she knows she's losing Bill. And I guess it goes to show you can take the man away from the storm, but you can't take the storm from the man or his ex-wife or his magic truck. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, she could tell because he says to Joe, you're ignoring what you have right in front of you. Me. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Your fiance is right there, you dickhead. We cut back to the national storm nerds behind their giant <laughs> 90s computers, and they have some news about another storm, Dave. Those two cells converge. Inbounds and outbounds have doubled. Actually, I don't know why I played that clip, because I have no fucking idea what those words mean. <laughs> I was going to say, you lost me. But by the looks on their faces, whatever they see, it's going to be a fucking nightmare. Totally. And speaking of nightmares, we cut to a drive-in theater slash motel complex where The Shining <laughs> plays, and our crew are recharging. I remember this scene vividly. Vividly. Dave, you and I both know, because of the 90s nerds, these storms are not done yet, okay? It's now dark out, so spooky natos are a very real possibility. Absolutely. While the movie plays, Joe takes some time for self-reflection and realizes that Bill got too real with her in that last scene, you know? So she signs those divorce papers in a hurry. We can't be surrounding ourselves with people who have legitimate points about our mental health and future. No, of course not. So Melissa's sitting in her room. She's thinking about her future with Bill as well, when all of a sudden, a dark wind blows. If anybody comes back at me with that actual reference, I will give them $5. Oh. What? Coming. It's spooky NATO. Spooky NATO is coming all over everything. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have a plan, you should probably fucking tell us now. I mean, what drive-in slash motel isn't complete without a garage that has a basement? I was gonna say, luckily, they are at a motel slash drive-in slash <laughs> auto repair garage. <laughs> so <laughs> it's Oklahoma. This is feasible. Get in the so they get into this pit in the auto repair shop and they take shelter as cars fly in. There's debris whipped around and the sound is very loud. But besides a minor head wound, everyone is okay and the gang's vehicles are miraculously not halfway to Nebraska. That doesn't include Bill's truck, though. Right. 
Now we cut to Joe's Aunt Meg when the wind starts to pick up. What? It's just a little bit of wind. It's not like we're watching a tornado movie. Oh, no. (laughs) I feel like the Jaws theme should be playing here. (laughs) Probably. So the crew emerges from the wreckage to find that the storm isn't done there. It remembers Joe and it wants more blood. (laughs) Do you tell which way it's headed? It looks to hit Wakita head on. The storm is heading straight for Wakita, straight for Aunt Meg, Dave, our favorite beefy aunt. <laughs> so the crew assembles. They're ready to hit the road with one notable exception, Melissa. She loves Bill, kind of, but she realizes <laughs> she realizes she can't compete with the sweet, sweet embrace of a violently rotating column of air <laughs> or Joe. So I guess it's over between them. The funny thing is, I'm not that upset. What's that mean? It means Bill has treated you like shit over the last 24 hours, and it's pretty goddamn indicative of the kind of man he actually is. Right. Plus, this is the perfect time for a breakup in the middle of multiple disasters. I guess at least she didn't do it mid tornado that would have been hilarious i rescind all my previous ideas she should have broken up with his ass mid tornado and walked off like a boss legit though i do feel bad for melissa and i think this movie as we talked about previously i think it handles it pretty well they don't make her out to be a villain like daniel from san andreas they just play out the nuance of two people who ultimately want two different things yeah bill come on you can be in wakita in about an hour so bill fucks off to wakita <laughs> and the entire town is destroyed yeah aunt meg's house is in absolute ruins so bill and joe hop in they find her alive and they pull her out just before the house collapses how nice you all came there over you go. <laughs> you're going to the hospital i'm gonna drive myself honey your car's in a tree around the corner everything is a total loss including the beef and they basically had no warning right and you know what it's funny because i was really relieved that thank god she's alive to, to serve random beef but now you made it you made me realize there's no beef to serve so they ship her off into an ambulance never to be seen again <laughs> i was worried about you he says i have a bump on the head and uh, maybe a broken wrist now joe gets meg settled into the ambulance gets her some care and stuff right. when another storm begins to brew it's a real big one though we're talking an f5 dave a uh, fuck that five blake it's happening mssl predicting an f5 and aunt meg ever the coolest fucking aunt she understands what this means for joe joe gonna happen to somebody else you go stop it as meg gets taken away joe is overcome with a realization based on aunt meg's destroyed sculptures in her yard Mm -hmm. the sensors and dorothy they need to be able to fly and joe has the perfect pepsi sponsored idea (laughs) on how to make that happen i need every aluminum can you can find we need cutters and duct tape we're gone We're on the road again, baby. Our crew takes all their Pepsi and Mountain Dew cans and cuts them into little pinwheels for the sensors, right? Yeah. This is their absolute last chance to get Dorothy to fly. They approach the absolutely massive F5 and they get into position. And I'm glad the tornado is just fucking hanging around, though. (laughs) It's just waiting for our crew to finish. The tornado is an NPC at this point. Okay, that's good. They put Dorothy number three on the road, right in the path of the tornado. They drive a distance back, and they stand and watch. But there's a problem. It's too light. No, it's not. Not only is it too light, the F5 vomits a tree (laughs) and knocks the Dorothy machine over, spilling the sensors everywhere. They got to get the fuck out of there. But the tornado has another idea. It vomits another tree, (laughs) and it upends Bill's truck, trapping them on the road. This is tense, man. Yeah, it's not as tense as what's about to get vomited out of the tornado, though. Luckily, the F5 isn't a total dick, though, and it sends a friendly tanker truck their way. (laughs) It gets them unstuck from the tree, but then also explodes right in front of them. I like how the tornado was like, I'm going to put this down right here, but also I'm going to let it float for a little bit. (laughs) It just cruises on through. (laughs) Now we're back on the road and Bill and Joe get an update on where the tornado is heading. This is actually their last chance. Last, last chance. Wait, I have a question. Where's the rival crew? Don't you worry. I'm glad you brought Jonas back up because he's going to be coming into play very soon. Mm -hmm. But first, they have one more Dorothy, Dorothy number four, and they're not going to fuck it up again. Nope. This monster's still moving northeast on 80. This is it. Last one. Last time. 
while Bill and Joe figure out their game plan, their old arch nemesis, Dave Jonas, and his corporate sponsor, Money, not Pepsi, <laughs> is back. Yeah, he's being a total jackass. Dude, so stupid. Bill and Joe, they see him, and they tell him, The twister will toss it before it reaches the core. You have to anchor it. Oh, sharing valuable information, Joe. Even if they can't succeed, they still want someone to succeed because the data is too valuable for the world for them to fight over who gets to it first, you know? Right. It's, like, really altruistic, and I think really gets you on side with the characters. They just want this science to happen. Yeah. Too bad Jonas is a fucking prick, and he also hates being alive. <laughs> Hang back a minute. We got a pretty good view from back here. She can shift her track, and if she does, she's going to come right at you. Maybe we should do what he says. When I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. Of course, Jonas does not listen to Bill, oh. and they drive straight into the fucking F5 without even hitting the brakes. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, ah, oh, fuck it. We just, just go ahead and die. Also, uh, did they just Final Destination Jonas' driver? I'm glad they did. I'm, he got a steel truss through the fucking brain, <laughs> and I'm glad they put him out of his misery quick. But uh, I also find it hilarious that they basically had a slide whistle sound sound effect as the black <laughs> SUV crashed and burned. <laughs> Anyway, fuck that guy. Bill and Joe, <laughs> they have to figure out a plan because they still have Dorothy 4. And the F5 is gobbling up everything in its path. It also regurgitates tractors and even a whole ass house in front of them. Yep. And then they fast and furious their way through that fucking house. They do. They drive through the house, which was done practically as well. This was a real house they drove through. Jesus. Maybe we should get off of this road. I think you may be right. Here's their plan. One of them is going to sacrifice themselves for science. It's not Joe, and it certainly ain't Bill. <laughs> it's Bill's magic truck. Yeah, uh, rip. Now they are driving through a cornfield. Yeah, are these the same cornfields as in Signs? <laughs> This is all a horrible, weird universe that collides, and this is pre-alien abduction, but... <laughs> Post-speed. I see this. I see. Yeah. So as they drive straight at the fucking F5, they have Dorothy strapped to the back, and they decide they're going to have the car keep going, and they're going to bail out. Yeah, because they're going to outrun the tornado on foot! I believe in them. What? They watch anxiously as Bill's magic truck goes, and it goes, and it goes... Then, that's right, the Jingle Bell sensors work. Hey, they did it. Was it worth it? Absolutely not. <laughs> I disagree. Data comes pouring in for the team, and the music swells, and everything is going perfect. Oh, fuck, that tornado's coming <laughs> right for them. Just like I fucking said it would. Bill and Joe outrun the F5 tornado, flying barns, combines, and everything. They take shelter in a nearby shed. This is very much like a horror movie. It is thrilling. Yeah, they take shelter in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre barn. They have like the scythes and everything. Right. And, and she goes, oh my God, who are these people? farmers dude like <laughs> this is all very standard farming equipment actually Wait, wasn't your dad a farmer before he yeeted himself into a tornado exactly talk to your fucking dead dad about it <laughs> luckily that shed has pipes and bill's also a civil engineer these pipes go down at least 30 feet we anchor to we might have a chance so our power couple attaches themselves to the piping as the f5 rips the shed away from them conveniently not even impaling them even a little bit <laughs> Also, how strong are these fucking leather straps? That's some tough-ass cow. <laughs> Their bodies twist in the tornado winds as the F5 passes over them. Say what you want about this movie, but this shot and the music is fucking awesome. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Now, the tornado dissipates and all is well. Joe and Bill have made it through their turbulent reunion. The rest of the crew, they come barreling down the road, music a roaring. It's a hell of a scene. We did it. Yeah, we did. Dorothy really flew. I do have one note, though, about this scene. Okay. When Joe and Bill, before they ran from the F5 tornado, they lost radio contact with their crew. Mm -hmm. Now, the crew is roaring down the street, music, you know, blasting. They're celebrating, coming to find... They're here as Bill and Joe. How did the crew know they were even alive? Listen, that radio is magic. Can you fucking imagine? They're coming down the road. Everybody's celebrating, smiling, music playing. And then they have to fish the corpses of their <laughs> friends out of the tree. <laughs> Jesus Christ, temper your expectations, people. That's the ending I want to see. I'll start a petition. Right. But luckily, though, that didn't happen. And Bill and Joe, they're back to their old bickering ways. 
I gotta get grant approval for a new warning system. We need a bigger lab. You gotta start analysis and all that data. Well, you're doing the analysis. I'm running the lab. You're running the, I'm lab? running the lab? I don't think so. The couple kisses. The team celebrates amongst the ruins of another family's entire life. <laughs> and then we roll credits, man. Dude, can you imagine you've been taking cover in your barn or in your shelter and you hear that it's over and you come outside to see everything's destroyed and random strangers celebrate their party. They're cracking beers and shit. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what did I ever fucking do to you? <laughs> Get off my property. <laughs> what property? Oh. I do really love this movie. I think it's a quintessential popcorn blockbuster. You know, it's a solid script. The acting's really great. There's a decent mix of practical and CG mm -hmm. effects. This thing is pure spectacle. It accomplishes everything I think it sets out to do. And I do have to commend that. It makes sense that despite some of the technical limitations, you know, and massive massive amounts of continuity errors yeah. <laughs> people still love this thing yeah i mean i still really liked it i remember it from my childhood so like i have a little bit of the nostalgic love for it i honestly didn't notice any of the continuity errors so it definitely kept me entertained enough to miss that shit so that's great this is actually the first movie where i discovered continuity errors were a thing like melissa she pulls up after joe's truck almost crushes her uh -huh. she has her window down and then she pulls up to talk and dusty opens the door and her window's closed now that's what i noticed first and i was like wait hey it's <laughs> hilarious wait. it's really fun yeah i did really like it even this time through you know i i didn't mind some of the bad cg it wasn't as bad as i thought it was gonna be as i remember it being like the cow scene i agree wasn't as bad as i remember it being no i totally i totally agree that's actually a, a pretty astute observation there i was expecting the cg to age pretty pretty bad yeah. and it's not great but i think it does a better job than i anticipated right, i agree i agree with you well if you got nothing else i got nothing else mm. and i think this is going to be a pretty good thunderdome i agree with you all right i'm ready for it you want to get to let's it? fight to the disaster <laughs> what <laughs> i don't know movie versus movie Welcome to the Thunderdome. The Thunderdome. <laughs> this place fucking rules. All right, I uh, recovering from whiplash here, Dave. How you feeling? Uh, I feel a little weak in the knees from all the vibrating underneath me. I feel that. Yeah. Well, either way, we're back here in the Thunderdome. We got some stuff to hash out. We sure do. So before we watch these movies, Dave, you and I, we decide on five things that we both agree make a good genre movie, in this case, disaster movies. So let's go through them. Absolutely. Let's do it. Number one, we have to have a disaster of epic proportions. Is everything fucked into the ground? Number two, we have to have endearing main character or characters. Are we rooting for these motherfuckers? Number three, we need life-threatening action. Is everyone literally about to fucking die? Number four, we gotta have believable science within the context of the film. Did you understand a single word? And number five, we have to have that big, dramatic climax. Yeah, dad sneeze or mouse fart. So hopping right into it, we're talking disaster of epic proportions. Yep. So Twister may not have the world-threatening disaster movie set up like Armageddon or something like Deep Impact, but I do think it's epic. It's a storm cell that basically creates giant tornadoes at a moment's notice that can show up anywhere and kill anyone and honestly probably bring down the home value of everything <laughs> and everywhere all the way down to zero. It's a yeah. full-blown physical, emotional, and financial collapse across all of middle America. I find that epic. Well, here's the thing. I agree and disagree with you at the same time. Number one, I agree that it is pretty epic. Hmm. However, I disagree because this just happens every year. Like, tornadoes just happen every year in Oklahoma. So it's just kind of like run-of-the-mill storms that happen. But they do set up from the very beginning. They say this is like a massive storm that this never happens. So it is not typical. Fair enough. So it's a, it's a thing that still happens sometimes. Occasionally. With San Andreas, we have something that literally never happens. It has the most epic disaster I've ever seen scene we're talking a 9.5 or 9.6 i can't remember which earthquakes a tsunami that is large enough to flood the entire city of san francisco i mean hell the ground literally split down the middle it's incredible dude no i i mean i agree california essentially ripped the seam of its pants with the first <laughs> thing you know <laughs> So uh, I got to give it to you. It is it is pretty epic, and I think it's presented in a pretty epic way because we do have our character who's a helicopter drive pilot 
not driver. Uh, driver. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of characters, we're going to go right into endearing main characters. Everyone in the world loves Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I mean, he had a move in the WWE called the People's Elbow. <laughs> what? That's a thing? Yeah. Fine, sure. But that aside, you do truly want his character Ray to succeed, especially because he's going through a divorce, sorta, and he watches both of his daughters die, even though he brings one back to life. <laughs> and he's a firefighter, okay? Does it get more endearing than this? I get it, but these characters feel very generic. I honestly think the only person who really sticks out is the British guy, Ben, because he has a funny accent. Because <laughs> <laughs> the characters in Twister are... I think what makes this entire movie stand out and endure the test of time. Not only are Bill and Joe relatably passionate about their work, but they respect each other, and that runs deep, even though the relationship is really complicated. They can put aside anything to work for a common goal, like murdering tornadoes. <laughs> On top of that, though, their crew is full of some of the funniest and goofiest and most supportive people, and I feel like I'm part of the crew as well when I'm watching this movie. I, I do agree with you that the, the crew is is endearing but if i'm thinking about this movie through the eyes of a 33 year old rather than through the eyes of a fucking seven year old mm -hmm. joe and bill kind of suck like they both kind of suck as people like they're they, they they they're those people that are too obsessed with their thing and they don't care who gets hurt in the process bill is a fucking dickhead and not on purpose he just is a dickhead and he can't help himself but he overcomes some of these things he has this relationship with his ex he has a relationship with his fiance he's trying to work all these things out and i think through these struggles of people not being perfect endear us to them because none of us are perfect i mean yeah but i think the test for these characters is through their action and how they handle stuff we're talking about life threatening action for twister I think it'd be easier to point out all the non-life-threatening action in this movie <laughs> than the opposite, because this thing is like jam full of action scenes with massive consequences. We got flying farm animals, we got flying barns, we got flying tractors, we got rolling houses, Dave. It's a goddamn Midwestern nightmare up in here, okay? It's just scene after scene of life-threatening action. I, uh, I'm not going to disagree with you. I do think that Twister does have a lot of life-threatening action, but with San Andreas? I mean, come on. Earthquakes. These characters have to make their way through buildings, falling down around them, fires burning in the distance, a tsunami, Blake, okay? They have to get through helicopter crashes, jumping out of a plane, nearly drowning, actually drowning, fast and furiousing their way over the crest of a tsunami. There's barely a moment of this movie that's not life-threatening. The life-threatening action is so much in this movie that it actually gets a little bit too much, and it's like, okay, calm down, guys. I don't feel like the action is life-threatening because all they do is just show how fucking cool Ray is and how he can handle any situation at all. The only people I felt who were in actual danger was Blake and the two British kids. I didn't feel any life-threatening action from well, that. Well, okay, to argue, because... Please. My job. This movie spent, I would say, more time with Blake and the Brits than it did with Ray and Emma. So, I would say, I would argue that Blake was the main character and Ray was not. And the fact that the main character fucking dies in the movie and then gets brought back just kind of proves that there is life-threatening action. I don't know the exact science behind, um, you know, being dead for like three full minutes before you're brought back to life. But then again, I don't know much about science in general, which brings us perfectly to our next point, believable science. So everyone knows that the San Andreas Fault is a real bad motherfucker, and when it shifts, it's going to be absolute chaos. So this movie is based on actual real science, but... In the actual scope of the movie, it's very believable science because it's real, just dialed up to 11, or more accurately, 9.6. <laughs> Nine point big. <laughs> <laughs> These aren't supposed to be the most sound, you know, scientific films. That's not the point of them for sure. Right. But there's still a lot of like really convenient things that he would say that then would immediately happen to like temper the audience's expectation so it felt a little wonky it felt a little forced in the science part of this yeah with twister we're spending time with the experts that's all we're doing even if those experts are corporate evil sellouts <laughs> i can't attest to the real life application of the shit they're saying i can't but it sounds believable and that feels plausible to me the way they're saying it they act on the information to solve problems and honestly it all feels sound enough i really think the believability comes down to the character work we're with these 
storm chasers who've been doing this forever and they have gear but they also have the street smarts and they're sniffing dirt and stuff like that so <laughs> i have to say points where points are due can't say the actual science makes sense but i really believe these people and i really believe their passion for the science okay listen that's fair but to be honest the science itself coming from the scientists in twister it doesn't feel very dramatic okay but the science in san andreas is extremely dramatic it is overblown but if we're talking drama and if we can move on yeah i want to talk about dramatic climaxes totally twister goes full blown horror movie in its climax and we essentially have two climaxes right dude we have like the main climax right where all the goals are accomplished by getting dorothy into the f5 but then we have this crazy horror action sequence where the tornado comes for them like fucking jason Voorhees. but (laughs) right once it passes though you know they can survive and they're fine and then we have the emotional climax of bill and joe and them making up it's a like nicely wrapped bow of an ending that still has a few surprises in there to keep you engaged all the way right up until the credits roll i really 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 love the ending of this movie i don't disagree i will say though that in san andreas the climax is very dramatic because ray saves his daughter and the two british dudes literally just in the nick of time granted he has to bring his daughter back to life but still to do chess compressions for two and a half hours to get his daughter to come back on top of that emma has to crash a boat through the windows of a building that's falling like a fast forwarded venice italy and ray smashes his way through debris to save his daughter with the lung capacity of a blue whale and everyone survives that's incredibly dramatic not to mention at the at the very end we get the nice Little bow, like you like you said with Twister, a nice little bow where the whole family is good, including the new British dudes. But what kind of takes this next level is the fact that they're looking over what used to be San Francisco. And that is dramatic. I understand, but I think it's drama in one way. I think it's family safe. Sucks about the city. I don't know what's gonna happen. It doesn't it doesn't give any hope for the future whereas twister not only do we have hope for all the science and data they were able to collect from this tornado but we also have hope with bill and joe they're both damaged weird people but now they can come back together romantically or not to continue solving this problem and to continue helping people so everything's fucked up and it's a mess Mm -hmm. but there's nothing but hope on the horizon for this thing and that was the big sell for me well listen for me it's just (laughs) I noticed a lot of times you like to add in things to our points, like the dramatic climax. Also, now there's hope for the future. Well, we're not talking about the future. That's we're talking drama, about what just happened. But that's drama. No, dramatic. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. What happens. Not only what mm-hmm. happens, but what does that mm-hmm. mean? Mm-hmm. That's That goes with dramatic. Because mm-hmm. there's no dramatic mm-hmm. climax without subtext, Dave. Yeah. It's storytelling, dog. I just don't think, to your detriment, San Andreas has those things. Well, I disagree. So let's just move on to the... <laughs> Let's move on to the finish line, because I think this is going to be an interesting one. It fucking might be. Hey, look, we did it. It's the finish line. We're at the finish line. Can I go home yet? Uh, all right. These are two surprisingly complimentary movies. I, I do agree. have to say, yeah. I'd never seen San Andreas before, so this mm-hmm. was a first viewing experience for me. Same. And I was pretty excited. I like disaster films enough, especially when they're set in a city that I currently inhabit, <laughs> and that's fun to see my future on the screen. Yeah. Not at all terrifying. <laughs> Not at all. San Andreas had some fun stuff. The Rock is really fun. There's Again, we see him in every vehicle. Mm-hmm. minus trains <laughs> and uh that was cool we get to see him being a badass you know doing all these crazy stuff so i had a lot more fun with this movie mm. than i ever thought i was going to oh, wow. i go into everything as open as i possibly could be wasn't expecting much from it and i got more out of it than i anticipated that oh. being said uh-huh. twister fucks <laughs> this movie <laughs> is great and i thought maybe you know i would feel differently it's been a little while since i've seen it and stuff but i've only ever watched it for fun and entertainment i've never sat like analyzed twister who does that us we're fucking losers but despite all the continuity errors Mm -hmm. despite the you know dodgy cg and stuff i think what holds this together really is the script and the characters and the action is just so much fun because it's always going on and it always is a blast so for me 
I have to go with Twister as my choice for first prize film. Okay, but he- here's the thing. Watching these two movies mm-hmm. and going through our five points, in my opinion, San Andreas hits all of those points better than Twister. Bitch, are you for real? For some reason, it just hits all of those points better. Wow. I think it has more epic disaster. I think Bill and Joe suck. I, I do. Wow. Uh, the life-threatening action. No redemption I mean, arc for them. No, I don't give a fuck. Life-threatening action, believable science, the whole, the whole nine. Interesting. So... I'm picking Twister because of nostalgia alone. <laughs> I was about to climb through this fucking computer. I do stand by what I said, though. I think San Andreas is a technically better movie, but I don't care. I'm still picking Twister because of nostalgia. I remember from my childhood. I remember loving it, and it's, I still love it today. So, Well, so beyond nostalgia, do you think it is the better genre movie? I think it's the better disaster movie only because it held up for the last... 26 years and i know san andreas won't that's a good point san andreas is nobody's gonna be talking about this movie it's dumb that we're talking about it (laughs) seven years later well shit okay i I, again i understand if you were gonna choose san andreas i would disagree with you greatly because it's a dumb (laughs) thing to do and pick but like you're dave and that's fine i accept you fair enough but i think i think you were right i think twister is hands down the better disaster movie it just is man and uh i'm gonna to watch mm-hmm. it again that's definitely another thing i definitely will watch twister again in my life i don't think i'll ever watch san andreas again don't need to <laughs> maybe the rock needs to have somebody actually write him a character arc um no hey first prize listeners thanks for tuning in this week thanks for destroying the planet with us if you enjoyed this episode if you enjoyed hearing mother nature kick our asses consider subscribing to our socials it's at first prize pod on all platforms and that includes facebook twitter instagram we're on tiktok and youtube as well also don't forget to check out our website it's firstpricefilms.com we do this for free because bill's magic truck leased some garage space from me <laughs> but if you'd like to support us consider rating and reviewing us on apple Podcasts or come hang out on twitch we stream every week talking about movies movie news and just chatting with y'all join us next week as we eat the brains of these zombie films yum we're talking about train to Busan, 2016 versus 28 days later 2002 yeah it's gonna be rotten rotting it's definitely smelly we should we should probably yeah. it's gonna be bad see ya bye ya It thrilled the fuck out of me. Despite, despite, despite the cars, despite my talking, despite my fucking life imploding right before our eyes. Oh, I love it.